Welcome aboard the Athletics Can't Wait Jets podcast, your nonstop shop for all things Jets. Now here are your hosts, Tim McMaster and Connor Hughes. Listen safely. Can't wait. Hey, anybody checking us out on YouTube, check out our sponsors in the description below the video. Also, subscribe to the show. We keep growing this YouTube channel. Uh, it's been fun to see. We are ready to put a bow on the OTA season, breaking down the third week of OTAs on the Can't Wait podcast. Tim McMaster here, along with Connor Hughes, Marissa Morris, getting an early start on her weekend, not joining us here on a Friday morning. We're talking about Zach Wilson's progress on this episode. We're going to talk about risers and fallers over the course of the OTA season. And a look back at Fitzmagic, the great career of Ryan Fitzpatrick and his time with the Jets. Uh, thanks for checking us out. Give us a five-star review on Apple as well. Uh, Connor, let's get right into it. The OTAs, we talked about it the last time we got together on this podcast. They're kind of boring. <laughs> so before we yeah. get into the players, we were hoping they would get more exciting and more intense. But for the most part, it was a cautious OTA season where this team is just set to... Uh, to not get injured at this time of the year. Yeah. So, I mean, it's, I, I thought it would be ramped up slightly, but it, it really has, it's really just been a passing camp. I mean, that, that's, that's what it's been. So it starts obviously with, with really loose uh, stretching, which is normal. Like it, it starts from the beginning portion of practice is very similar to how training camp would be, you know, just without the pads or, or any in season practice where, you know, the jets go through a walkthrough to begin practice. Then they do their team stretch. Then after the team stretch, they go individual drills, you know, quarterbacks, wide receivers, all the guys separated by their positions. Then uh, positional groupings will come together. So linebackers and defensive linemen will work together, quarterbacks and safeties, um, cornerbacks and safeties, quarterbacks and receivers. The running backs will go through their drills. Um, and then after that, though, is, is normally we would go from there to like a very brief seven on seven, then 11 on 11, basically throughout the rest of practice, going from situational work, driving the field work, red zone work, and then go on. And when Todd Bowles was this team's head coach and Rex Ryan was this team's head coach and Adam Gase was this team's head coach, OTAs and minicamp all followed that same script. The only difference is that when the team period came together, guys just weren't in pads, but you still did the same things that you did in training camp. You just couldn't have contact because guys weren't in pads. That is a hundred percent. Not the case. The jets basically go from that individual drill period to they come together for a team drill. Uh, it's 11 on 11, but the court, the offensive lineman and defensive lineman basically stand up in front of each other. So there's not even the, the pass rushing without pads. They basically just stand up in front of each other. Um, no run plays at all. The jets are not working any of their run game at all. Uh, only pass plays and some of it's situational. So like on uh, Wednesday, for example, they were working on third and twos and third and shorts. Uh, it looked like on Thursday, I couldn't see the exact marking, but it looked like it was a, a normal first and 10 situation where they were just running through their offense. Uh, during the second uh, set of OTAs, the second week of OTAs, they were going through team drills again. It was like another third down situation. First set of team drill or first OTA, they did no team drill period at all. So at least they added in one section of team drills, but it's literally like Zach Wilson, in the offense gets eight reps. Like he runs five to start, comes off the field. So Joe Flacco and Mike White can work, comes back on for three more, uh, three more snaps. And then he's off and it's all pass plays. The quarter, the cornerbacks and receivers are going full speed, but that's pretty much it. And then after that, it's all seven on seven drills. So the offensive linemen go and do their thing. The defensive linemen go and do their thing. And you just have quarterbacks, receivers, running backs, and tight ends going up against linebackers, cornerbacks, and safeties. And, and again, a passing camp. So it, it's a, it's a bummer from my perspective. Like I get why the jets are doing it. Their, their thought process is that there's only so many hits big men can take. There's only so many times offensive and defensive linemen can collide together before eventually you're getting bruised, you're getting battered, and you're going to start losing some reps and losing some time on the field. So in their mind and in their thought process is if we limit the hits now when it really doesn't matter in June, these guys will stay healthy longer August, September, October, November, December, January, all the way through, you know, through the end of the season. And, and if the Jets make the playoffs, you know, into the playoffs. But from a reporting standpoint, it sucks because normally <laughs> OTAs and minicamp is like, it's really fun to cover. Like, I like it, you know, because you kind of have this gap of December, January ends, the regular season's over, you're done. There's no more football. You then have January, February, March, April of no football. You're covering training or um, you're covering uh, free agent signings. You're covering pro days. You're covering the combine. You're covering the draft. You're covering rumors and rumblings and all that stuff that, by the time you get here to OTAs, 
yeah, there's no pads, but it still is football. It's two hand touch football. So you get to see all the new draft picks. You get to see all the new uh, signings. You get to see all the new players, the new offense, the new scheme, everyone working together in a football like setting, doing football like things. So when Todd and Adam and, and, and Rex would run through normal practices, you got to see the receiver, Brandon Marshall, Eric Decker, Quincy Nunn will go down the field and make really impressive grabs. You could make highlights and say like, you know what? Austin Safarian Jenkins, the year that he broke out, it was like, man, he looks really thin, which we came to learn. He lost 30 pounds. And then not only does he look really thin, he's making play after play after play. And it was like, wow, you know, you got to make these observations and, and, and they were June observations. They weren't like, oh, make or break, but it kind of set the stage where it gave you a taste of what you were going to see come training camp. And it got you kind of an early look at like, this guy might be setting the stage for a breakout. This guy might be setting the stage for a big season. And you could keep your eye on those guys when training camp came. So from a, a team perspective, I get it. It's probably smart. You know, they're, you're, they're limiting the hits from a reporting standpoint though. It sucks because observations are, are few and far between because not only is it not football, it's it, not only is it already padless football. Now it's, intense intensity nullified football where it's just it's a it's a it's it's very very laid back very it's a very very laid back passing camp really that, that's what it is so if it's a passing camp the one thing you did get to see is zach wilson yeah. passing the football um also some of the new weapons at least going through the motions and that sort of thing so let's start with zach before we jump into some other risers and fallers uh you have a story out on the athletic that talks about risers and fallers as well but zach wilson year two you know there's the mm -hmm. steps along the way i remember a year ago going through these same steps with him as a rookie now it's a, a year removed um, let's talk about the good and the bad first with the bad. I mean, he threw some picks. He wasn't always, um, super on time, right. During these drills, during these OTAs. Yeah. I, yeah. It's again, like I, I, like I wrote, like when I was, I, I talked to Allison, like my editor after, after that, this last OTA, because I was going to do a practice report. And I said to her, I was like, I'm gonna be honest with you. I was like, there's, I watched Wednesday. I watched Thursday. The Jets canceled Friday for a team building activity. Like you're probably going to do top golf or bowling or something like that. Um, I was going to be honest. That. Yeah, I know. Right. I was like, I, I'll be honest. Like, I'm not, I'm not totally sure. Like, I don't, I don't have enough here to write like a two. Like, I'm really going to be scraping the bottom of the barrel and just basically like saying, you know, like old, when you used to have a word count limit in college and you, you, know, you turn can't into cannot, just like have the two words to like stretch it out a little bit. I'm like, that's basically what this is going to be. I was like, so what if we look at like a risers and fallers? Like, cause now I've seen all the OTAs, all the ones that were open to the media, the, the four total. I was like, I'll just do a cumulative who impressed me, who didn't that kind of a thing throughout the, the let's do an, uh, basically look at all of the OTAs in one to make a story as opposed to trying to stretch out one OTA and make a story. And she agreed. And you know, when I was going over risers and fallers, Zach was the one that I was looking at over and over and over again, because there was no doubt in my mind that, that he was a, if you're going, you know, who's up, who's down. He's definitely down, but the problem is that like, I knew that putting his name on that list was going to <laughs> cause hysteria. And so I prefaced it in, in the story that's up there on the athletic of like, I know this is going to cause hysteria, but let's calm it down because it's still just OTAs. It is still padless practices. It is still an intensity nullified practice from what OTAs normally are. There is no reason to hit the panic button yet. There is no reason to freak out yet. There is no reason to think that the Jets have a bust on their hands or they are screwed or they're, they're going to be steamrolling towards a two, three, four win season because, again, they don't have the quarterback. And, oh, my God, can we can we re, re, recapture Mike White's sanity or can Joe Flacco be elite again because we're so screwed with, with Zach Wilson? It's not that. It's just going into year two, I had a, a baseline of expectations of what I hoped to see from Zach Wilson in OTAs. So – I didn't go in here thinking he's got to throw five touchdowns a day. I didn't go in here thinking he's got to be 19 of 21 every single day. I didn't expect to see bombs to Corey Davis and bombs to Garrett Wilson and bombs to Elijah Moore and deep passes down the seam to Conklin and Uzama and all these other guys and, and crazy swing routes to Mike Carter and being like, Oh my God, the jets have a superstar on their hands, right? Because this is still the first real football that they've taken part in since they walked off the field in, in December, January. So there's going to be rust that needs to be knocked off. There's going to be an acclimation period for these guys where they 
learn to play together again. And with so many new faces on the offensive side of the ball, especially when you loop in the guys that are coming back from injury, it's going to take time for everyone to, to come together. But I still had this baseline of wanting to see a more decisive Zach Wilson, of wanting to see a more in control Zach Wilson, of wanting to see a, a Zach Wilson that was more comfortable and, and looked more like he understood and was taking that next step. You know, it, it wasn't about statistics and stars and, and great passes and, and heroics and fireworks. It was more like just having this baseline average of every single day. There were some, there were some better plays. There were some worse plays, but here's the average of like, you know what? He, if, if the big play wasn't there, he still checked it down. You know, if, if the big play was there, he took a shot or maybe he just missed it or a guy dropped the pass or something like that. Instead, over the course of the four OTAs, and again, we only saw four. We saw one week one, one week two, two week three. I just never, I wasn't overly impressed. I, and that's why I put him as a faller. Because I, I just, I was never, there were at moments and times impressive throws. Like on Thursday, he made this really nice pass to Garrett Wilson as, as Wilson was kind of coming off the field on like a deep drag. And he lasered it to him and he split the defense and it hit him right in his hands. And Wilson lost it at, at, as he fell off the field. Uh, there was a long pass to DJ Montgomery who beat Sauce Gardner. So there was good, like there was still good from him. There was a really nice touchdown in the red zone to Corey Davis and a nice fade route that he threw in a seven on seven drill to Garrett Wilson for a touchdown in the red zone. But there were just the bad outweighed the good. And I don't think there was ever that average baseline, you know, and, and again, there's no reason to panic. It's still so early, but I just went in there expecting to see a quarterback that looked like he was more in control more certain of what he was seeing, um, more comfortable and more decisive. And instead, I never really got that. You know, the the accuracy concerns that we saw as a rookie, I still kind of saw them in year two, where there were guys that were open short. And I'm not talking about, you know, not hitting a 55-yard pass. There were guys that were open short, and Zach's left of them, he's right of them. You know, there, there was a play, I remember, where Garrett Wilson's coming across the middle on a drag route. He's open. Like he's there and and Zach throws it and it's behind him. And Garrett's got to like turn and twist and try to make a catch behind him as he's sliding to the ground and the pass is incomplete. That's just got to be like bang, bang. Like that, that, that's just hit that pass. Like it's not, if that pass is complete, that's what I mean by the baseline average. That's a five, six yard pass. Just hit the pass. It's a five or six yard completion. We're putting a check mark next to it instead of an X on the stat sheet. And it's like, okay, you move on. Like that's a baseline average. It's not overly impressive, but like when you then miss that pass, it's, uh, you know, he threw two interceptions in in the red zone that were telegraphed to defenders, like one that went right to a, to White, and another one that went right to Pinnock, and it was just like right to the, like just bad passes. Like, why are you throwing it? Like I said, the Jets only ran the eight team drills. They were in seven on seven drills the majority of the time. There were so many times where I'm sitting next to Costello or Samini or Dennis, and I'm like, and we're all looking at each other, we're like, oh. Well, that was going to be a sack because these are seven on seven drills. I mean, these are right. these are these are seven on seven drills where it's supposed to be pitch and catch. Like I think it was uh, Joe Montana or maybe it was Peyton Manning, one of like the historically great quarterbacks, said like I should complete a hundred percent of my passes in seven on seven drills. There's no reason for that. Instead, there were several passes, like like more than you would think, where Zach's like running around, he's trying to go like, and part of this has to do with the receivers getting open. And I guess you can hat tip to your secondary, but it's like. Guys just aren't there or Zach's looking in the wrong spot. So he's then running around and doing a, he's turning a seven on seven drill into a scramble drill. And it's like, what is this? Like, it just, it looked very, very, very rusty at times. Uh, The offense as a whole and Zach, um, the accuracy was obviously a concern. Some of the decision-making was a concern. And I'm not even talking about the turnovers and potential turnovers and things like that. I'm talking about, um, I'm not even talking about those. I'm talking about, there were plays where, He completed passes to receivers where if this was a game, those guys were going to get decapitated. Like he threw one to, um, I think it was Braxton Berrios on Thursday where he was coming over the middle and Bryce Hall laid up. But if this is Bryce Hall, I mean, we're not even talking about an elite level corner. We're talking about Bryce Hall, where if, if this was a game, Bryce Hall is lowering his shoulder and taking his head off. And it's like, why are you throwing that pass there? Like, that's not a window. You can't do that. It's either going to be, you're either going to kill your guy or the pass is going to be deflected up in the air because in a game, Hall's going to close and hit the receiver. He's not going to pull off because no one has pads. So I wouldn't panic yet. I, I, uh, a strong mini camp next week when we're there for we, – we just got the schedule. We're there the 14th and the 15th because they don't have a, a mini camp on the 16th. So a strong mini camp on those two days, it erases all the struggles of OTAs. 
a strong, a bad mini camp, but then a strong start to start to training camp. It erases all of the concerns for OTAs. But as a reporter, I'm still there to report. As a reporter, I'm still there to make observations. As a reporter, I'm still there to to look at these practices and try to take something away that can help me with my job as we set the stage for mini camp and eventually training camp. And for me, watching Zach once week one, once week two, two times week three. I can't say anything other than I hope to see more. Am I worried? No. Am I concerned? No. Am I panicked? No. But I wanted to see more from him, and I didn't see more from him. That's that's probably the, the best way to describe it. And again, he can erase all those concerns in the coming weeks. But right now, I can honestly – I can't sit here and say like, oh, Zach, Zach looked good in OTAs. I can't, if somebody asks me how Zach looks, I can't say, oh, he looks so much better than he did his year one. I can't look at him and say, oh, he is such a better player than year one. I can't look at him and say, oh, my God, he's going to take a huge jump. I can't say those things because after watching it, I wasn't overly impressed. I just wasn't. I saw I saw a quarterback that looked very similar to the quarterback that I saw last year. And I was talking about this with DJ. Like, the two of us were like, honestly, I, I, at times, I actually thought he had better moments as a rookie in OTAs than he did in year two in OTAs. And and that could be like, you know, the Jets are putting more on his plate than just the vanilla version they did as a rookie. So we're going to see still a lot of time, no reason to panic or anything yet. But when it comes to Zach, which is the the person that everybody cares most about, I just wish that I saw more from him. Well, the short passes is something that, you know, wasn't a thing in college for him. And we talked about this last season. It kind of became a thing over the course of the season where he was, you know, skipping, um, drop downs to running backs and that kind of thing. And to see that again, because we've talked about the fact that those, those are just the automatic things that just happen. Mm-hmm. It's not like, Oh, I see the guy breaking off his route. I got to hit it between, you know, the, the corner and the, the safety, like that sort of thing. It's, it's the quickie. It's the easy pass that whether it was mechanics or what was off. So to me, that should be the thing that we should see fixed first as he's more comfortable in year two. So to me, that's a little concerning that that was still a thing in these OTAs. You saw, I I will say this. So, so the, I mean, we only see practices and we only see brief practices, right? I haven't gotten the sense from any, like the, the jets are not like, like raising red flags yet. Like, I mean, they, they see things in meeting rooms and stuff like that. And and when Zach makes a bad pass and he goes back and he talks to the floor or he makes a bad pass and immediately steps back from the huddle and he talks to Calabrese or he talks to Sala he like they're able to see things there from those conversations. They're able to glean more f- about where he is. And and they've seen like, so last year when Zach would make a bad pass and, and LaFleur would go to talk to him, it would be like, he would give a billion and one reasons for why he thought what he did. For, he, he would give like a billion and one reasons for why he did what he did, why he thought that was the right decision. And then he would give like a hundred more reasons of a hundred different things that he could have done. And it was just an example of a quarterback swimming. It was an example of a quarterback thinking too much. Now, in year two, when Zach steps back, even when he makes a bad throw, he isn't wondering. He knows, one, exactly what he did wrong, and two, exactly where he should have gone instead. There's not like a billion excuses. There's not a bill excuses is a bad word. People are going to bug out when it's like always making excuses. No, there's not. There's not a billion potential justifications for why he did what he did. He knows, one, exactly why he did what he did. And if it was the right call and if it was the wrong call, as soon as he steps back, he goes, you know what? I went one. I should have gone two. two was the right read. And he knows two. like, he's not overthinking it. He is simplifying it. Like there are those positive signs, which again, like the Jets said, when, when we talked to Sala uh, before many, before OTA started, we were like, you know, now that the off season program's underway, what can you see? We know, you know, training camp, regular season, but what can you see from Zach now that will give you hope and optimism that he's going to, that he's going to be the guy or he's going to have a big second year jump. And one of the things that he told us is that is that you'll be able to see a better understanding. You'll see him in the film room. You'll be able to talk to him and know, okay, that's different. And then eventually when the talk matches, the play matches, then you see a second quarterback. So the understanding in the brain is there. Like it's much less cloudy. It's much less frantic. It's much less um, overworking and on hyperdrive than it had been as a rookie. It's just that the play hasn't yet followed. You know what I mean? Like he's still he he's still yeah. making the bad throw. And it's good that he knows that he made a bad throw and why he made the bad throw. And he knows exactly where he should have gone instead. But I just hope to see less of those bad throws. You know what I mean? I, I hope that the gimmies 
would just be gimmies. They would be that. That when you have Garrett Wilson sitting down in the middle of the field or Garrett Wilson running a five-yard drag across the field or there's a curl or something like that, that those are just automatic. That they're you're not even thinking. It's like your feet are right, your arm is right, you hit him and he, he makes them. And it's just, it's not a highlight. It's nothing I'm going to make a note about, about, oh my God, what an amazing three-yard curl route to Garrett Wilson. Or, oh my God, what an amazing drag route to Corey Davis. It's nothing that any of us were going to talk about on the podcast, but it's like, hit those throws, make those throws because those shouldn't be takeaways for the bat. Like when you miss them, when you're way off with them, that's when it's like, well, that that's what, that's what makes these, you hit five of those and then you have one bad interception. It's like, oh, it doesn't matter. But when it's, you're missing those and then you have the bad interception and you don't have the big plays to counteract it, it makes you, again, it, it makes you want for more. It makes you crave more. It makes you lust for more. Like you want to see more from him. And I wanted to see more from him in OTAs just from a baseline average perspective. And, and I'll be honest with you guys. Like I, I did not see that. I can lie to you. I, I can sit here and like, you know, I, that's why I, get, I crack up on Twitter. Cause you know, I, I say a Zach Wilson highlight and everyone's like, yeah, let's go. And then I say a low light and I just get flooded with trolls. Like you don't know anything about football. And it's just OTAs. It's just practice. It doesn't matter. I'm like, well, if it was just, if he threw five touchdowns today, you wouldn't be saying it's just practice. You'd be DMing every Dolphin fan, Bill fan, and Patriot fan saying, F you guys, guess who's coming for the chip this year? You know what I mean? Like, you'd be going nuts. So it's my job to give you the good, bad, and ugly. And it's my job to, to give you the truth of what I see and the honest takeaway of what I see. And my honest takeaway is that I'm really not overall that impressed with him to this point. Doesn't mean it can't change. Doesn't mean you should panic. Now, if I'm saying this second week of training camp, yeah, panic, dude. Like like second, third, fourth week of training camp after a preseason game, yeah, sound the alarms, raise the red flags, let's panic here. Right now, not time to panic. Right now, it's just time to put a little asterisk up there like, hey, make note of this for when training camp starts. Joe the Jet in the chat saying that, uh, can we stop overreacting? It's just practice in June. To that, I would say... It's a podcast. That's what we're here for, right? Is to react to what's going on in June. I mean, I should tell my we're reacting. Like, I don't think we're. I don't think we're overreacting, Connor. I think no. we're reacting to what you're seeing Correct. and telling people what you're seeing. It's not Which overreacting. Ex- I think we put enough. This can be corrected in a week. This can be corrected in two weeks yeah. into this conversation. So, and yeah. dude, like I like I, I did a mailbag like the two weeks ago or something, maybe a week ago. Uh, all these days kind of learned together. And I was like, hey, I was like, what? Like, who's got questions on the Jets? Like, send them to me. 99.9% of them was how does insert player here look in practice? Right. So it's like, I can't just, I'm not, I'm not just going to sit here and just like, like give you nothing but the pot. Like you want to know how they look. I'll tell you how they look. Like, could you imagine if like, everyone's like, Hey, is that, how's Zach Wilson look? How's Zach Wilson look? I'm like, oh, I'm not going to tell you. It's just practice. How's that? How's <laughs> this guy? How's this guy? I'm not going to tell you. It's just practice. Imagine like when my editor is like Allison and she's like, Hey, are you filing your story today? No, it's just practice. No, it's just OTAs. No, I'm not, I'm not filing anything today. It's just OTAs. I'll tell you what Salah says, but not. I'm, I'm not filing anything today. It's just OTAs. Like, no, it's football. It does mean something. Like, there is value to this. If there was no value to this, the NFL wouldn't hold them. If there was no value to this, coaches wouldn't give two shits about them. If there was, like, like Salah wouldn't be sitting up there basically begging Makai Becton to show up for OTAs if OTAs did not matter. Like, that's the fact. Like, it does matter. You can glean something from this. Don't panic yet. It doesn't mean Zach's screwed. It doesn't mean the Jets are screwed. It's just something like if you want to know how he looks so far, it hasn't been that great. Like, that's just the fact. All right, let's take a break. Then we'll talk about actually other players. Of course, now I'm going to be told team. I hate the Jets. This other than right that. Well, right. Yeah, that's yeah, not, But I'll see. I hate the Jets, by the way. So that's that's actually why. We'll be right back. I know we like to have a lot of fun on this podcast, but there's something I got to warn you about. Our testosterone levels deplete with age. Yep, no one ever tells you about that, but I am. And experts believe that testosterone affects a bunch of important parts of our overall health, like bone mass, sex drive, muscle health, and more. Thankfully, Roman's testosterone support supplements were designed by real doctors to make sure your body is maintaining its greatness. Testosterone is an important part of a man's body and health, so it's important to start supporting it early. Dietary supplements are a way to aid your body's natural functions if you feel like diet and exercise are not enough. Roman T support is meant to help men maintain their body's natural testosterone production. Roman Tea Support is a proprietary supplement formulated by Roman's in-house doctors. You can't find this blend anywhere else. 
ashwagandha to support healthy testosterone levels, magnesium to support muscular health, vitamin D3, a fat-soluble vitamin that plays a role in bone health and supports several cellular processes, and zinc, an important trace mineral in the body that plays a role in muscle development. Roman offers flexible monthly plans with free two-day shipping. Go to GetRoman.com slash wait today. If approved, you'll get $15 off your first order of Roman tea support. That's GetRoman.com slash wait. GetRoman.com slash wait. It's officially summertime, and there's no better way to kick off summer days than with a nice bowl of Magic Spoon. Growing up, cereal was one of the best parts about being a kid, but we had to give it up because we realized it was full of sugar and junk that you really shouldn't eat until Magic Spoon came along. There are zero grams of sugar, 13 to 14 grams of protein, and only four net grams of carbs in each serving, and only 140 calories a serving. It's keto-friendly, gluten-free, my favorite, grain-free, soy-free, and low-carb. And you could build your very own custom box. Available flavors to build your own bundle include cocoa, fruity, frosted, peanut butter, cookies and cream, maple waffle, blueberry muffin, cinnamon roll, and honey nut. And even more exciting, Magic Spoon just brought back their cereal bars. They were so popular that they brought them back permanently. And it's a perfectly convenient on-the-go companion for your cereal. So if you want to try some out, go to magicspoon.com slash wait to grab a custom bundle of cereal and try it today. And be sure to use our promo code wait at checkout to save $5 off your order. And Magic Spoon is so confident in their product, it's backed with a 100% happiness guarantee. So if you don't like it for any reason, they'll refund your money, no questions asked. Remember, get your next delicious bowl of guilt-free cereal at magicspoon.com slash wait and use the code wait to save $5 off. Thanks to Magic Spoon for sponsoring this episode. All right, we went we went a lot deeper on Zach. What's that? Marissa was real. She was she was real hype for that read. I don't think I've ever yeah, seen her excited. evoke such emotion. Like when she said cinnamon roll, cinnamon roll. Gosh, she was she was hype for that one. Wow. I, I don't gotta, think I she had been it. able to do a Magic Spoon read for like a month, month and a half. Cinnamon so roll. She, yeah, a lot of excitement. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Um, uh, all right, we spent a lot game. more time on Zach Wilson than I thought we would, so we're going to probably have to go a little quicker through these other risers and fallers. Um, but that's all right, because that's what people want to hear about anyway. Let's go risers, because it was kind of a damper there on Zach Wilson. So let's boost things up a little bit. Uh, and the risers, Connor, you look at that secondary, and suddenly a safety uh, position that got better due to free agent signings. Uh, looks like it may be deeper due to some some development of young players. Let's start with Ashton Davis are we finally going to get a guy that makes us look back on the 2020 draft class and smile? Yeah. I mean, that's, that's pretty strong, but I will say he's having <laughs> great OTAs. Like he's got two interceptions. The one he had on, um, on Thursday was awesome. Like he was, he was following, I think it was black who was, who was playing the, the slot receiver position. I, I think it was him uh, coming across the field on the, on like a, a, a crossing route. Davis was locked in with him. Uh, I think it was Mike White or Flacco went went to it wasn't Wilson uh, went at him. Uh, Ashton cut across to cut off the receiver. The receiver interfered with him, and as he's being interfered with, sticks out his hand, makes the grab, and 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 picks it off. So he's made some play after play. He had another pass where where he picked it off deep. I couldn't. It was where we were in the end zone. It was tough to see how the play actually developed as opposed to the other one because the offense was driving away from us as opposed to to coming at us. Um, but he had another interception, which he took back to the house. So he's impressing. Now, the, the thing we've talked about with Ashton Davis numerous times is that he's been, he was drafted as a developmental project and has never been given a chance to develop because he was supposed to sit behind Marcus May and Jamal Adams and then eventually replace Marcus May. Jets trade Jamal Adams. Ashton Davis is forced to play right away, but he's forced to play right away without having OTAs or mini camp and a condensed training camp because of COVID. Has a rough rookie year, gets hurt. That injury sidelines him, OTAs, minicamp, and all of training camp in year two. So he's now going into year three, and he's never had OTAs. He's never had minicamp. He's never really had a fully healthy training camp where he's been able to have an offseason where he prepares for it. So early on, the, the, the signs are promising. Now, he's working entirely with the second team defense, but those signs are promising. Now, what I will say is that coverage and, and playmaking and speed and athleticism has never been Ashton Davis's issue. His problem all of last year is that he was almost inept when it came to taking the correct angle to get to a ball carrier. I mean, he was a complete and total liability in seeing the running back break through the hole and being like, okay, I've got to go get him. I mean, running the, 
you hear yards after contact, there should be like a yards after Ashton Davis tries to tackle you stat because like the <laughs> angle that he would take for some of these guys and the extra yards they would get after it really was remarkable. So like I said, this 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 OTAs and it's going to be the same for minicamp has been a passing camp for the Jets. Like it's been just practicing the passing and they haven't run it yet. So I want to be able to like get to tr- get to the preseason and watch that all 22 film and watch the film back and just watch specifically Davis and see the angles he takes and if he's better in that regard because if he can improve there to parlay with, with his coverage ability, I think the Jets might have somebody that that saves the 2020 class might be a little strong, but but at <laughs> least it you know they might have somebody that that is a a quality backup safety and somebody who can play special teams and somebody if something happens to Jordan Whitehead or or um, uh, Lamarcus Joyner he can step in and, and maybe even find himself working into some three safety packages. All right, let's stay at that position because you mentioned LaMarcus Joyner. He's been out, so he's a faller for for not being on the field where other guys are thriving. And the other guy that's really picked things up is Jason Pinnock at the safety position. Yeah, yeah, this kid, I'll tell you, so every year, every single coach says like, and, and I, I've bullshitted with Salah about this numerous times, Um they all say the same thing. They're like, don't pay attention to the reps. Don't pay attention to the first team reps. When you see a guy getting first team reps in OTAs and minicamp, it doesn't matter. Don't pay attention to it. It doesn't matter. No, because if Pinnock couldn't play and he wasn't competent and he hadn't impressed the coaching staff, he'd be working with the second team like um, Ashton Davis. He'd be working with the third team like Elijah Riley. He'd be working with the backups and not seeing any reps. With Joyner still working his way back, it is Whitehead and Pinnock as your two starting safeties. And not only is 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 Jason look like like he's in there and involved and like he's not just like a, a placeholder. He really is looking like he belongs. He had a great interception to Zach Wilson in the red zone. You can tell he has that infectious personality where his teammates just go crazy. Like when he picked off that pass for, from Wilson, he dropped the ball and did like this little shimmy shake after he picked it off. And his entire, the entire defense sprinted to him and went crazy. And this was in the middle of practice. This wasn't like the last play of practice where you make the play and everyone goes nuts. This was just in the middle of practice. He did his little dance and everyone went crazy. Now, I don't necessarily think that he's a starter in 2022. Like he's not pushing Whitehead off the field. I don't think he's going to push Joyner off the field once Joyner's ready to go. But in 2023, 2024, I think that's when you could really see him stepping into a starting role. And and maybe he does push for playing time and push Joyner off the field if he shows he's ready sooner than expected. But this is a guy that, that you know, you talk about late round gems, late round finds, guys that you pick that you don't really think anything of, and then they turn out to be players. I think he could be a guy that we talk about for a while as drafted as a corner, converted to safety out of necessity, really dove into that full force, showed some promise towards the end of last year, spent all of off season prepping for it. Mini camp OTAs, training camp, learning the position, getting better at the position that 2023, 2024, he might be this team starting safety because it's clear that the coaching staff likes him. They just still need to develop him a little bit, but there is legitimate talent and a skill set worth developing with this guy. And, and I, he's, he's one of those that I'm very fascinated to see over the next few years and the next couple of years and the next few months, honestly, just to see how he continues to develop, because there's a lot of promise there. There really is. And if you want somebody to be like, Oh, late round gem pot possibility, he's one of them. Cause I, I think that he's uh he's got a lot of potential there and he's clear, like I said, clearly impressing the coaching staff. All right. Tight end. Another position with two risers here, Tyler Conklin, obviously a guy that they brought in and then, Let's get to Conklin first, but then it's fascinating that Lawrence Cager is yeah. impressing at tight end. So let's go Conklin first, though. Obviously, uh, Uzuma and Rucker not in these OTAs, so basically it just opens the door for Conklin to get yeah. all these reps. Yeah, and, and look, I mean, look, LaFleur is going to have that rotation. Like, this isn't going to be something where, like, oh, Conklin's having a good OTAs, Conklin had a good training camp, now they're going to completely forget about CJ and Rucker. Like, that's not... That's not the case. That's that's not going to the, the LaFleur is going to use every single one of those. You know, Uzama is going to be kind of that traditional tight end. Ruckert's the developmental project and Conklin's kind of the do it all athlete that, that they're going to have out there. But you can see to this point, he's really developing into kind of a um, the, the safety net for Zach. Now, now that's still Braxton. Like Braxton is still like when all else fails and Braxton's on the field, Zach looks for Braxton. Like you can tell they've got a rapport. You can tell they've got chemistry. You can tell that's his, you know, that's his, that's a safety blanket, but Conklin in the red zone, Conklin on third down Conklin in short yardage situations. Zach is starting to from 
week one to week two to week three. He's starting to go to him more and more and more and more, especially in the red zone. And it makes sense. He's an athlete. He's big bodied. He's got good height. He's got good size that he's starting to really turn, turn some, turn some heads in my opinion. And and you can tell that they're starting to be with, with the other two guys out and even Elijah Moore dealing with an injury now too. You can tell that Conklin's taking advantage of those reps with Zach and the more reps he gets, the more passes that they complete, the more times he sees them and, and he gets comfortable with them. When games roll around and camp rolls around, that's going to be the guy where when one, two, three is not there, just find my safety blanket, go to my safety blanket. And, and I think that's going to be Barrios and Conklin. And the other guy you mentioned, Lawrence Cager, he's working with the third team. He's working with the, the second team, occasionally works in there a little bit with the ones because of the injuries to the other two guys. But from a passing perspective, Cager's turned my head and, and, and it's, it's every day he makes two or three catches Every day you kind of catch him open. Every day you look at him because he's a big guy and he's fast. And you're like, wow, that's a that's a tight end. You're like, oh yeah, that's that's Cager, the former receiver. So there's a lot of athleticism there. There's a lot of um playmaking ability. You can tell that he is a matchup nightmare when he's going up against linebackers because obviously he's a former receiver. And because of his size and his receiving ability, he's also a little bit of a problem for for safeties as well. So again, this has been a passing camp. So when we're talking about Ashton Davis, well, he hasn't had to show it against the run. It's almost the same thing with Cager, where he's been allowed to shine now because he's a former receiver now lining up against linebackers and safeties. He should sign, should shine. The key is to see Cager do it when he gets reps as a blocker because that's the key. He's a former receiver, and I know he's bigger and he's put on muscle and he's packed on the weight and he's always been a physical player. But being a blocker when you have to block a defensive end or you have to block a linebacker, that's different than beating a linebacker in pass coverage. So there's, he's somebody that, that I'm very fascinated to watch come training camp because I want to see him in the run game. I want to see him blocking. I want to see that stuff because as a, re, as a receiver, he's becoming a matchup problem for, for these guys at this new tight end position. And now I just got to see him, see if he can hold up in, in the run game as well. And if he can, maybe, maybe he's a sneaky candidate to make that, make that 53 man roster and, and push West go off. Maybe we'll see. Yeah, I was going to say, is there, um, you know, is there a path barring injury to the roster for him? Or is he, would he, would he get through to the practice squad? Probably. Right? Uh, practice squad. Yeah, he he would, unless he has a huge training camp and somebody That's signs. Here is he, he catches like two touchdown passes in a yeah, preseason yeah. game. Yeah. It's that, I mean, that's, that's possible. I mean, he's got to beat Yaboa obviously as well. And, and he's got to push Wesco out whom Wesco is obviously the big blocker, but I think it's still a long shot that he makes the 53. I, I do. I do think it's a long shot because just learn. It's, it's hard to just learn how to block in one year. Like it's, it's very difficult to do that. It takes time. And when you're not a first round pick, like I remember watching an old hard knocks with the Dallas Cowboys and Martellus Bennett was there and he was a rookie and the Cowboys were stressing to him that if you want to make it in this league, you got to learn to block. And in college, all he did was catch. So he was a terrible blocker as a rookie. They worked with him and put in the effort with him to learn how to block. He worked and put in the effort to learn how to block. He learned how to block. And when he went on to play for the Giants and then the Bears and the Patriots, Martellus Bennett was one of the best blocking tight ends in the NFL. So he not only brought it from a size, physical, uh, physical ability, athleticism perspective, he could also block. And I, I always cracked up because I remembered watching as a kid the hard knocks with him where he couldn't do that. So he can learn. Cager can learn. It's just a matter of doing it. But Bennett was like a second round pick or something like that. So they were going to give him the time to learn. Cager isn't. So I still think it's probably a long shot that he makes the roster because of who he's got to beat, but he might be somebody that they're able to sneak onto the practice squad there, keep developing and, and who knows what you might have with him. But I mean, he's, he's proven to be a problem in the passing game here when he's had to go up against linebackers and safeties. All right. I wanted to bring up, um, there's a story on ESPN this week. Um, mm -hmm. there's a lot of positive vibes around this jets team right now, right? It was a good draft in most people's eyes. Uh, they did well in free agency to upgrade multiple positions. Uh, Zach Wilson entering year two, a lot of reasons to think this team is going to be better. Um, and then ESPN had a story this week based on their football power index that predicts the jets will have the number one pick in the 2023 draft. Shout out um, Walter. I think that's probably yeah. Seth that's piecing yep. that together. Uh 13.6% chance that they will be number one, 68.4% chance that they'd be in the top 10. Now, being in the top 10, all those teams in the middle tend to be bunched. So being yeah. 10, you know, whatever. Um, but if that was to happen, Connor, I assume we're gonna be looking at full holes. Everybody's out, right? Everybody's gone. Head coach, GM, quarterback, if this team ends up picking number one yeah if if after what yes if the if the, I, I would if the jets are picking top three again and 
they if if the Jets win one game, two games, three games, which is what I think it would probably be. To, uh, you got to be like three and fourteen again to be picking top three at that point. Yeah, you do, you need wholesale changes. That that's when because I mean Joe Douglas has now had three full off seasons to put his team together, three full drafts, three full free agent signings. And I know the Jets were in a mess, but he still has had three full draft classes. This is the year where the Jets have to take a jump. I cannot stress that enough. I'm not talking going from winning two games to four. I'm not talking going from winning four games to five. I'm not talking about you can't blame anymore the you cannot blame the uh, uh, last regimes anymore. You can't blame past coaching staffs anymore. You can't blame McCagnan. You can't blame Gase. You can't blame the schedule, even though it's difficult, because while it's hard at the beginning, it gets much, much easier after that bye. The Jets need to win seven, eight, or nine games this year. That needs to happen. There has been plenty of time for Joe Douglas. There has been time now for LaFleur and Sala. They have to win seven, eight, or nine games this year. If they win three, if they win four, that's bad. I mean, there, there is there is no justification for this team after spending money for three years and drafting for three years for them to win four games again. They're not. So if they're picking number one, it's a shame to only give a coach two years. But if they're picking number one, knowing Woody Johnson and how impatient he is, he's going to make wholesale changes. If they're picking number two, he's going to make wholesale changes. If they're picking number three, probably going to make wholesale changes. If they're picking top five, I could absolutely see wholesale changes again. Like this is not Christopher Johnson anymore. Woody Johnson is back. Woody Johnson's running through. Woody Johnson does not have any patience whatsoever. Like he does not. Like it's not how he works. It's never how he's worked. He's not going to deal with empty seats in the stands again. So now, like I said, I did my schedule prediction. I have the Jets winning seven to eight games. Like I think so. If they win seven to eight games, everyone's getting year three. Zach's getting year three. Robert's getting year three. Joe's getting year however many this is on now. Like it's like they're all getting they're all getting another year as long as they win seven games. If they win six games, I think there's a chance that that they get more they get that chance. That, you know, if, as long as they win six games, I think they're probably coming back. Seven games, everyone's definitely coming back. Five and fewer is when it gets murky. And, and five, I I would probably still bring them back if they win five. If it's four, three, two, one, I I think it's again it's it's been we're not talking you you can't there's no more excuses. There's no more excuses. Like, really, that's the case. Is there's no more excuses at this point. You have to take a jump forward, and you have to take a step forward. And we did do our predictions. I think you said eight and nine. I said seven and ten. So both yeah. of us at least confident that this team. Yeah, I think, this, I think uh, it went. Especially yeah. now, you flip that Brown game. I think I had them losing to the Browns. I think I had Watson playing. You flipped that. that oh, game that's next. true. There's no that's... way Watson's playing now. So, I mean, you. I think you. They can win that Browns as long as they win. There's that 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 first nine games where it's or heading into the bye week nine. I think it is like it's it's a brutal stretch. As long as the Jets can come, as long as the Jets can have between three and four wins going into the bye, they are in a very, 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 very good position when they come out of the bye. They just need to find a way to get those three wins. I think the Browns are a win. I think the Steelers are a win. You need to steal another one of those games. Maybe it's the Dolphins if Tua stinks, like I think he does. Maybe it's one of those. Like you just need to find a third game because I think you, I think you'll beat the Bengals. Or Bengals, I'm sorry, no. I think you'll beat the Browns without Watson, no doubt. I think you'll beat the Steelers because it's either Trubisky or Pickett, and I think both those guys stink. So I think you can beat those two teams. You need to now find a third win. And if you find that third win, you'll be fine once you come out of the bye. Yep, absolutely. All right, one more thing to get to, and that is Ryan Fitzpatrick. Calls it a career, steps away from the NFL. Yeah. Nine teams, 17 seasons. Uh, he played 166 games, 147 starts. Threw for just under 35,000 yards, 223 touchdowns. Uh, the record not great, 59-87-1. and one, But that's because when you look at Ryan Fitzpatrick's career, he bounced from bad team to bad team to yeah. bad team. He was that guy that was able to step in and start for bad teams. But there was one pretty good team that yeah. he started for. He never made the postseason in those 17 seasons, but he was oh so close in 2015 with the yeah. Jets. They went 10 and six. He threw 31 touchdown passes that year to 15 interceptions. Um, Tim Graham of The Athletic wrote a good story this week where he talked to four members of the Bills team that beat that Jets team uh, in week 17 to keep them out of the playoffs and basically asked them because that that Bills team that had Fitzpatrick for years loved him and so he asked yeah. them would you give that game back 
now that you know he never made the postseason to get him in the playoffs. Um, Football players are competitive. One guy said, yeah, I would. The other three said, no, I'm never going to give up a football game. But it gives us a chance to reflect, Connor, because you were covering the team back then Mm -hmm. on that. That team and that game and how close this Jets team was to making it. It was also... um, It was magical. um, Yeah, go ahead. It was fits magical. That that whole season, I'll I'll never forget. It's it's the one that I can hang my hat on. So I was in college still. So I, I graduated Monmouth in 2015, but uh, 2014 I started covering the Jets. So I was I was writing for About.com at the time in the Journal Inquirer, and I would basically leave. I, I couldn't do road games because I was, you know, not making near. You know, About.com and the Journal Inquirer were not going to cover me to go on the road. Plus, also I couldn't be missing Monday classes while I'm flying home from road games and you know whatever. So. Uh, but I covered all home games. And I was at every practice. And then I would just cover the the road games from my couch. I would watch the Jets and write my stories off of that. So I was around the team every day. Wednesday, thir- I would leave class on Wednesday, leave class on Thursday, leave class on Friday, go down to practices, write, cover, and 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 do everything. I just didn't go on road games because, like I said, I was in college. And that team, I remember from the very beginning, was just wild. Because the the whole Fitz thing started with, with Geno Smith getting punched in the face by IK. And... I remember what was what was crazy. And you know, we talk now about Zach, right? And OTAs and minicamp not meaning anything. Geno Smith, during that stretch under Ch- in Chan Gailey's offense with Brandon Marshall and Quincy Anunwa and, and, and Eric Decker and all those guys that they had in 2015. Geno Smith's OTAs minicamp and first week of training camp during that stretch is the best quarterback play I have ever seen from a quarterback. Like it was like he was like, it was the point I was writing every single day. Like, Oh, it's one, it's only one practice. Only two, only two practices, only three. And it was always like, no, Gino is having a hell of a summer. Like it, it looked very much like that season. Gino was supposed to break out. And then I'll never forget that we're, we're sitting in uh we're sitting in the press or the media room for the jets. Like we're sitting in the media room for, for the jets waiting for training camp to start. So now uh, like OTAs, mini camp, it's like uh, Sala and Gase talked before practice. Todd used to talk after practice. So we're all sitting in the media room. Me, Rich, Kaz, Kmart's still on the beat at the time. Dom Constantino's the beat writer for for the Ledger because again, I'm at I'm at about.com and the Journal Inquirer. And Todd walks in the media room, and this is like right as we're getting ready to go out to training camp practice. So right as we're getting ready to go in, Todd walks in, and I think it was Costello that looked at him and goes, "What the hell are you doing here? Did you miss us?" And Todd shook his head, and all he goes is he goes, you're going to want to record this one. And we all walked into the media room, and we all got up on the podium, and Todd, I will never forget. I still have the audio recording. He goes, he's like, there was an incident in the locker room. Uh, Geno Smith was like sucker punch. He's got a broken jaw. He's out for the foreseeable future. IK and Impali uh, has been released. And it's just like all of us. It was the only time this and Sam's mono were the only time that the coach made a statement and then there was a 30 second silence from the media as we waited for just kidding. Like you went and then <laughs> you hear it. And, and then he, we're like, really? And then he goes, yes, IK has been released. And it was just like, I'll be honest. I've never seen from just the, it was all just the normal daily beat writers there to all of a sudden, every television station, ESPN's got people there. NFL. Now it was wild how much everyone descended upon like the stadium. And then you got like, Gino taking selfies from the ambulance with like gauze in it. It was just a wild, but to start from there to then go on this magical journey of a season where it really was fun and wild. And you just got the sense of, of not team of destiny, but you got the sense that there was just something different about the jets that year because Decker was dominant. Brandon Marshall was having the most prolific receiver from a, a prolific season from a receiver in Jets team history. Fitzpatrick was just doing these magical things. And there were hiccups like the Texans game. There were hiccups like I think the Raider game where he got there was a whole big storyline about how Fitz couldn't slide. Fitz never slid. And then because of that, it led to like injuries twice where he actually he was definitely concussed against the Texans, then got hurt against the the Raiders and Gino came back in and then Gino lost the game because he ran out of bounds short on a sack. Like just wild stuff. But Every time we got closer and closer and it got, they beat the Cowboys was a huge moment. Then they beat the Patriots in overtime and you're going into that week 17 game and you're like, holy crap, the Jets are going to make the playoffs. And that was a game where I remember I got in a car and I drove to Buffalo because I got, I got the, the, the trip expense. I remember seeing, cause it was like, holy crap, the Jets are going to go to the playoffs. This is a potential playoff clinching game. I got to be there. So I took off class on Monday. 
drove to the game and like watched it. And as the game was unfolding, it was like, holy crap, they're going to lose. Oh my God, they're going to lose. And the underrated storylines throughout that game was that one Bilal Powell didn't play. So I don't know how many fans remember this, but the second half of that year when the Jets really got hot, started rolling, and it was like, wow, the Jets might make the playoffs. Because that was Mike McCagney was GM of the year. Todd, if they make the playoffs, Todd's coach of the year. Bilal Powell's resurgence behind Chris Ivory was a major factor in the Jets offense going to a complete other level against the Giants. Like, remember what he did against the Giants. Like, it was like Bilal Powell's resurgence did it. Bilal Powell got hurt and didn't play week 17. So the Jets had uh, that that um, running back from the 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 Patriots, whose name is escaping me. It was a hell of a quote. He was the dude who had um, a thousand yards for the Patriots, fumbled, and then like Belichick never played him again. Number twenty two. Do you remember his name, Tim? I, uh, uh, looking. Someone's gonna be in the comment section and tell me he played a year for the Jets. Um, whatever his name was, he was he was I remember his number twenty two. Was the Patriots running back? The Jets signed him, so they had Ivory. And they had this running back, like this this guy, but then Powell jumped him. So it was basically Ivory and Powell was a one-two punch. Something happened with Ivory. Uh, I've never Ridley. figured out. Ridley, there you go. Yeah, Ridley. So Ridley ended up playing the majority. And Ridley was he wasn't good anymore. He ended up playing the majority of that game against the Bills because one, Chris I something happened with Chris Ivory because the Jets basically didn't play him until the third quarter. Like something weird happened there, and Bilal Powell was hurt. So you had Fitz struggling. The Jets lost Powell. Chris Ivory, who when he got on the field against the Bills, ran rampant because he had a hell of a season that year. It was just like this dysfunction of just a, a breakdown in that game. And then you had Darrell Revis just getting torched because he was hurt, and Todd refused to give him help. Todd kept him man-to-man, one-on-one coverage, refused to give him help, and Sammy Watkins just burned him time after time after time. And what I'll always remember is that there was still a chance for the Jets to win. Because Fitzpatrick threw the one of the best passes that I saw him throw all season down the right sideline to Ken Brell Tompkins. And it was right there in his hands and he dropped it. And he's going to catch that, run into the end zone, score a touchdown, game is over, and the Jets are going to win or tie it or something like that. And it was just, he dropped the pass. And it was, I remember seeing the look on the faces of the guys as they walked off the field, being in the locker room as that season ended. None of them could believe it because they thought the game was won. They thought the game was won. And what I always tell people about that game, because they ask me about it like routinely, the Jets were going to advance. And you net like it was going to if the Jets won that game, if I'm not mistaken, their first opponent in the playoffs would have been the Cincinnati Bengals. So they were going to play the Cincinnati Bengals in the first round of the playoffs. The Cincinnati Bengals, if you remember, lost Andy Dalton. So they were going to play Cincinnati without Andy Dalton. They were going to beat the Bengals. Like, there's no doubt in my mind that they are beating the Cincinnati Bengals without Andy Dalton because the Steelers, who got in instead of the Jets, beat the Bengals. Like, it was it was going to happen. Their next opponent was going to be the New England Patriots, who they had taken to the wire in Foxborough, and then they beat them at home in overtime when Eric Decker caught that touchdown. They beat the Bengals. They go toe-to-toe to the Patriots. If they beat the Patriots again, the Ryan Fitzpatrick-led Jets are in the AFC Championship game. And if you're in the AFC Championship game, anything can happen. Like, at that point... Anything can happen and you never know. Like you really don't know. And it's just, I remember looking at that season and being like that you, they felt like a team of destiny. They really did. And going into that week 17 game, never in my wildest dreams did I think they were going to lose that game. Never. I thought they were going to win. And then when they did never in a million years, did I think that that would be the last week 17 meaningful playoff implication game that I would cover. Like that's the last one I've covered is a chance. Is a, that's the, that's the closest I've ever come to covering a playoff team is right there in that. That is the closest I've ever come to covering the Jets with the playoffs. And the way that it went downhill from there when, you know, the the saga of Fitz re-signing, not re-signing in, in 2000 and uh, the next year is just obviously crazy in 2016. But, you know, it's the, the, the 15 season when Fitz left in that whole year, it was one of the most fun seasons I've ever covered, one of the craziest times I've ever covered. There were so many things that happened before, during, and after. It's just, it's wild, man. It's wild. And it's it's, for me, it's the ultimate, it is really genuinely the ultimate what could have been because it, it, it is the ultimate what could have been with, with that team. Because again, they're going to beat the Bengals and then they're going to Foxborough and you never know what's going to happen there. That was the year in the end. Peyton Manning and the Broncos ended up going to the Super Bowl, winning the Super Bowl. And, and that's how that one ended. But yeah, what a uh, <laughs> what could have been. All right. That's going to do it for this edition of the podcast. As always, you can read Connor's great writing 
at The Athletic, and you can do it for cheap right now. Go to theathletic.com slash can't wait. $1 a month for the first six months. Can't beat that deal. Um, we'll be back with you probably in two. Well, we got mini camp next week, right, Connor? So Yeah, so we'll, we'll do one after maybe. mini camp. Yeah, after mini camp, uh, because after that, it is the break before training camp. So we'll talk to everybody again probably late next week. Thanks for joining the Can't Wait podcast.